It's simple. It's probably already in your home and it's a Montessori classic. It is the humble pitcher. Whoa. <laughs> We're going to talk about how to use it, what kinds are best and why kids love using them so much. So welcome. Come on in. This is Montessori 101, a child of the Redwood series, all about the magic of Montessori. We believe that every child deserves a Montessori education. I'm Aubrey Hargis. I'm David. Uh, and today is the next installment in our series on Montessori essentials. So as Aubrey just said, it's simple, it's humble, it's probably already in your home. It is the the, the beautiful picture, and it's a classic. <laughs> the humble picture is a classic of Montessori. So uh, we're going to talk about, like I said, how to, get, how to use it and why kids love it so darn much. Uh, by the way, if you're interested in our full list of Montessori essentials, you can download our full packet on our website, childoftheredwoods.com. There's a free downloadable, uh, and it includes this and 20 other essentials that you might want to add, which will be featured in upcoming videos if they haven't been featured already. Yes, and if you missed the first one in the series, we've already talked about the pink tower. That's right. So if that interests you, go back and watch that one. It'll be available on YouTube or on the podcast. That's right. Yeah. All yeah. right. So let's dig in. So I have here kind of a selection of pictures. So right. we'll be showing that, you know, and I, we, we tend to collect them. Montessorians <laughs> tend to collect pictures and that's why it's on the list. Right? right. Um, but let's just talk kind of basic and absolutely. Yeah. So what is a picture? <laughs> well, I mean, this is a picture and also we would count this as a picture. And uh, look at these fun little guys. These are pictures. So if you're just listening, uh, I've shown you three different types of materials, porcelain, homemade earthenware, uh, some metal. We've got a few other options in front of us. They're just pictures, right? Uh, and the so main... So essentially a cup with a little spout. A cup, a cup probably with, with a, a little... handle. Cup maybe not. A, maybe but... a handle, maybe not. Yeah, and, and something to kind of direct the pouring because that's the main use. It's a it's to practice pouring. So uh, this earthenware one, which uh, did one of our kids make this one? Yeah, Jude made that. All right, so our our youngest one made this uh, in a ceramics class that he took last uh, so semester, and uh, it's a very nicely done, and it has a little indention on the side to pour. It's a pitcher. Everybody knows what a pitcher is, right? It's a classic material that you find in the practical life area. So there, when our with our research, we found there were 10 areas uh, in, when you look at the primary and the lower elementary curriculum, and I think probably extending all the way up, we would argue these are the 10 critical academic areas all humans are going to focus on or should study. And uh, one of those is practical life. So that's mostly found in the five and under set. That's the primary, two and a half to five. Uh, and its pur purpose is pretty pretty straightforward. It's to help you practice. It's, it's a pretty basic thing, but actually it's super great for physical development. Uh, and so what you're going to want to have around your home is an assortment of sizes and shapes because it's more interesting and it's going to help match to the different tasks, the kinds of things that kids pour. So pretty simple, pretty humble. Why is it so important? Why would it be one of the 21 most <laughs> essential things that you could have as a Montessori? Yeah, well, um, so first I'll say that I have always loved collecting pictures because they kind of represent Montessori to me, maybe even more than the Pink Tower, even though the Pink Tower is a... Um, sure, it's super you know, it's, iconic, right? It is. It's iconic. But when you yeah. actually really get into a Montessori classroom, you see a lot of practical life work, especially with the little ones. Um, and by the time a child gets to be elementary age, we more or less expect them to know how to use everyday objects. This is just my mug, not a pitcher. Um, but I'll contrast it with a picture. I'll just pull this one up here. And you can see how the design with this, if you've ever tried to pour out of a mug, um, you probably know that you probably are going to get some dribbling down the sides, you know. Yeah, right. That's right. <laughs> it's, it's just not as efficient, right? It can be done. You can kind of quickly pour out of your mug in a way with liquid so that mm -hmm. the liquid goes directly into the other receptacle. But it's, it, it's a lot harder to do, right? That's and right. even for adults, it's just not as easy, but if a if there's liquid in a pitcher, you um, you know the the spout really easily you know just kind of helps things to not drip so much down the side. You can see this one is even designed with a little indentation here to help the water to to mm -hmm. escape down without 
dribbling. Um, so it's just something that humans designed a long, long, long yeah, time ago. Yeah, some of our <laughs> earliest artifacts that we find are earthenware yeah. pitchers and things yeah. like of that sort. And if we think, you know, back to before we had running water in our homes, you know, we turned on a faucet, you know, where would humans go to get water? We'd have to go down to a lake or go down to the river, or find a running stream. A well, um, maybe. And then we would have to mm -hmm. carry them back with us uh, and then have something to, to to be able to most usefully um, transport the water around. And ladle it out of a, of a yeah, big common. Without spilling a whole lot. Because, because all that sweat and work you've done to carry the, the yeah, water so up really, the hill. You really Jack don't want to don't lose a drop of this precious water, right? It really is a precious resource that we don't think about so much in, in our Yeah, modern at least here culture. in like the U.S. and and. and uh, it's we take it for granted, right? You turn we the do. faucet, it comes out. Not true everywhere in the world, but here it is, and um, that's why these, you know, pictures are sometimes they seem sort of simplistic. Like it's it's a, I mean, how many times have you got seen a picture just sitting holding flowers or something like that? But it's actually an ancient and really useful thing. Yeah. Well, Maria Montessori herself, she lived in. Um, an era where there was less running water than there For is sure. now. Yeah, um, you know, by the time that she had her children's houses, 1907, there was a lot of water, you know, a lot of indoor plumbing and yeah. water around, um, but not, it just wasn't as ubiquitous as it is today. Correct. You know, yeah. you wouldn't, if you went into a really old, I imagine if she went into a really old building or a really old house, you know, Hopefully there would be running water there, but it could be that the building was so old it hadn't been updated with totally. plumbing yet. You know, so um, yeah, I mean, to give you a sense of the context here, she was born in with the 1880s, right? And she died in the 1950s. It's completely possible that she was born in a house without running water, but she almost certainly died in a house that had running water because within her lifetime, it had become much more ubiquitous, and so. It's amazing when we think about how quickly that transformation has yeah. happened and what that might have done to inspire her as she's thinking about watching kids do something very practical, like carry a cup of water around. So one of the most famous Montessori works that involves a pitcher is the hand washing work, ah. um, which involves, you know, a very old school. What would, what would you do in a house if you didn't have running water and you needed to wash your face and your hands and brush your teeth in the morning? Mm -hmm. You have a bowl and you have a great big pitcher. Uh, and you would fill the pitcher with water, pour it into the bowl, and then do your hand washing in there. That's your little sink. Inside, your wash basin. Your yeah. wash basin inside yeah. your own bedroom or in your, you know wherever it is. Um, and then you would go and take that dirty water and, and you either reuse it or you might go and dump it out. And yeah. your pitcher, your big pitcher might still be there for you to pour some fresh water in and then wash your hands later when you were ready. So this was kind of the system that she was working within. Um, and it was one of the very first things she taught her children how to do was to clean themselves. And if they were cleaning themselves with basins and pitchers, the use of a pitcher was really important to get the grasp of mm -hmm. pretty quickly for these little children that were in her care. So uh, I think that she pretty quickly realized um, that if she didn't teach the children how to use a pitcher, they wouldn't be successful with those other kind of practical skills. That's right. So it's it's not as true in our time where, you know, if our children want to drink a water, um, they don't have to go and, and fill a pitcher, you know, and pour <laughs> it for themselves. Right. Usually they don't have to. It can be a learning opportunity. Um, but, uh, and we, we, we can run back and forth. We clean our paint brushes in the sink. We, uh, we go back and forth between that sink all the time mm -hmm. for cleaning and for, um, you know, all, you know, all kinds of things, right? Drinking sure. water, uh, cooking, that sort of thing. Um, and not quite as true back then, uh, you know, and before in Maria's parent, you know, parents and grandparents time as it is today. But um, if we think of the picture in the way that she did, which is, okay, this is a critical skill, she's thinking, but as her children are using the picture, she's noticing something else happen to That's the children. Right. They are developing stronger and stronger motor skills. So what does it take for a little, like a two and a half year old in order to lift a pitcher, let's say about this size that would be used to, or like a big watering can that would be used to water plants or um, to wash one's hands in a basin. Yeah, it could weigh several pounds depending on how big the yeah, picture so is and the be, material. Yeah, so the picture could be really big. You know, for us, it might be a half, but for a child, it might 
be like a third of their body weight or oh. half of their body weight, right? Which was an enormous ask for a child. So she noticed that while children were handling different sizes of pitchers for different things, um, they were starting to, their muscles were starting to behave differently. They were starting to refine those, um, those motor skills, both gross motor skills, the large motor skills, and the small motor skills. So if you think big picture, you're thinking core strength, you know, your, mm -hmm. your child is, um, anytime you lift something up heavy, right? You're mm -hmm. like, you're using you're a lot using of muscles. Your, you're using your abdomen, yeah, right? Your back, chest, maybe yeah, arms, shoulders, legs. and yeah. um, you're really lifting. And so the children who were using the heavy kind of watering cans and big pitchers in her school were getting stronger uh, than the children who weren't doing that kind of work. So that was, I think, one of the things that she noticed first off the bat. And the second was the children who were using little, like little creamer pitchers, mm -hmm. and these are, um, Here's two from like a little restaurant supply type of thing. They actually, I don't know if you can see that. They are the same size. I don't know if you can see that live. Mm -hmm. um, but what does it take in order to manipulate a little creamer pitcher? This one is much lighter, so it's mm -hmm. not going to take any big muscle strength. It's going to take a lot of fine motor control between these two hands. Right? That's right. And you have to tip it just so, so that a little stream of water escapes and dribbles down. And if you're filling something like a vase, <laughs> uh, which we do in the classic Montessori flower arranging work, or if you're even if you're just filling your own like cereal milk bowl, mm -hmm. like you, know, you have some cereal in there and you want to pour in a little milk, you're not, you know, you could just sloppily just dump it in, but you're going to splash the milk, you know, and it's just not going to be as interesting yeah, an experience. Your cereal might go all over the place. Yeah, you might slosh, slosh it. Yeah. So Maria noticed that even very little children, when given materials like this, they could learn to have extraordinary control over their muscles. And the children who practiced more, you know, and, and enjoyed the, the pouring experiences, um, they actually developed stronger fingers. Mm -hmm. And those were the children who became better, more advanced writers when they were learning how to hold a pencil. So she made a direct line between pitcher to pencil. And that was something that was revolutionary. No one else had really thought of this in her time period that you might connect. And even today, I think it might be a stretch mm -hmm. for a lot of modern preschools um, totally. in, in education to, to really connect the development of fine motor skills with practical household skills directly to literacy. Well, this goes to her genius. I mean, you know, we talk about Maria. She really was a genius in a lot, in a lot of areas. And this is sort of one of her core moments of genius is the recognition that uh, everyday play is the work of the child, right? It's, it's one of her famous famous sayings, some construction of that. And it's supposed to that. You might just think the child is carrying it and pouring the milk or the water or whatever. And she realized that actually they're learning really important skills that aid them in life. And through mm -hmm. using her training in science and in medicine, she was able to connect the dots. And through her very, very meticulous observation, she was able to then begin to create environments or activities lessons that would help reinforce it so she used observation and a very open mind to not saying well just dumb kid stuff kids just playing in the sandbox all kids just play in the sandbox all kids just pour stuff like that's just what kids do it's human nature that's true but it's actually not just mindlessness she recognized that there was something really important uh, in in what they were doing. Yeah, so not just physical development, but also cognitive development. Exactly. Going on. Can you imagine that? Because she must, if you had a bowl and you're, I was thinking as you were describing, you're pouring the milk in, you have to learn to estimate. There's visual discrimination. You're thinking mm -hmm. that if I pour it too fast, it all comes out. If I don't pour it fast enough, it'll dribble. It waits too long. I have to pour. And then I have to know how, how to turn my hand enough to stop it in order to, and to recognize like some amount is going to continue to come out. Because there's a lot of things going on in your brain and in your body, that mind, brain, uh, uh, body, mind uh, connection and that you're, you're working on when you make that happen. It is. And that is all leading to the development of concentration. So which which Maria <laughs> Maria really put concentration at the very top, you know, and um, I think a lot of people come into Montessori hearing that children will learn to focus and concentrate and that will make them to be smarter, yeah. <laughs> right, um, or academically successful. And there are some lines right between focus, determination and 
academic success. That's right. But she really saw it as as the development of this unseen human muscle, you know, where, you know, our, our and, and today we probably could do MRIs or something while children are pouring with pictures and see what lights up. Yeah, she would use but, observation. Mm -hmm, with, but she was noticing that the more children engaged in very, very simple household activities that required physical activity, movement, um, and concentration and focus in order to be successful, not spilling that one drop, that uh, they became better at other types of work as well. So, right. you know, once, you know, if you have a little child who enters a Montessori environment and you want them to go right to those golden beads um, <laughs> and do math, yeah. uh, you're missing a huge opportunity. A big step before that is to allow children lots and lots of experience with this practical life stuff. And actually uh, this picture activity we've talked about sort of historically mm -hmm. was very common and you know, for us living in the U.S., it's incredibly rare. You just go to the sink, you turn on the faucet, you fill up a bucket or, you know, if you're going to mop or a cup or something or the sink itself. And, you know, it's very, very convenient. But when we only rely on that or only have our children do that, we're robbing them actually of something really valuable, which is doing something that comes natural, the desire to play with the weight, to feel the weight, to fill it, to pour it, to measure in their brains, to do that concentration. Uh, and so, it seems funny, like we often talk about, you know, modern technology sort of is taking away, like Ooh, email took away the art of the letter writing. But actually, uh, the way technology works is it's true everywhere, including as something as mundane as the sink, the kitchen sink, actually kind of makes it less likely that the child is going to have an opportunity to practice something that humans have been doing for countless millennia. And so it's kind of a watchword to us as Montessorians that don't Overlook that. Take the picture you have, whether it's a juice picture, an iced tea picture, a little flower picture, whatever you might have. I suspect you probably already have one or more and put it in front of your child. Let them play yeah. with it. And how exactly would they play with that? Okay. So <laughs> I think most children probably have their first experience pouring in the bathtub right. uh, with measuring cups or, you know, we tend to give children things to, to fill, little containers to fill. I'm thinking, I'm looking at those nesting cups, you know, they're made mm -hmm. out of plastic. They're so common. Mm -hmm. Almost every household seems to have one these days or a variety of them. It seemed like over the years with two kids, we ended up with like four or five different sets of little plastic but how many of you have, of uh, how many times did the kid just take a cup into the, like a, a cheap plastic yeah. cup or, or something and just take it in there and pour it? I yeah. Mean, that's a, you know, it's yeah, not it's meant to be a pitcher, but it's just fun. It's yeah. fun for kids to do. So, um, so probably your child already has had a little bit of experience with pouring already. If you've been giving them baths and allowing them to like play in the bath, play in the water. A lot of families will have a water table. We'll also have some equipment out there and children can just very freely scoop up some water, transfer it to another container and pour with it. Um, and also the sandbox is a really, really common experience for children. Because it doesn't have to be liquid, little. right? No, it can be either wet or dry. And so having both experiences is great. So I remember when we got our sandbox, one of the first things we did was just put a variety of kitchen tools out there. Yeah. Um, and we didn't really give less. I didn't give any lessons out there or no. really in the bathtub either. Those were free open spaces where they were lessonless areas, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> for the most part, where our children were just freely exploring the materials and they naturally would start to pour and transfer with them. Isn't this, an, this would be an example of the prepared environment, right? So yes. what Mona Maria teaches us is that actually the kind of the adult's role is to get out of the way. The guide or the teacher is to sort of observe and to create the right environment. So not to go out there and say, now you're going to take the picture or you're going to take the spoon or you're going to do this or that. It's just to make the materials available. The child will, has, will have a natural inclination, inclination to go to it. And by providing them that environment, that prepared environment, you're giving them the resources they need to practice really critical things. Yes, but why why don't we stop there in Montessori? <laughs> Good question. Right? Like, I mean, you might, this is something common that you might see at a typical daycare is Absolutely. like a water table or something. A why, sandbox. Why or... go further? Why give a lesson? 
Um, Maria Montessori believed that children didn't just need open area spaces to play in, that that was something that they did need was access, but they also needed role models for these particular movements. And she believed that the adults um, could be those role models for children. And that if we practice these, these things ourselves, you know, carrying pictures across the room very carefully, how to, you know, filling them up to just the right amount, pouring them with intention, then our children could learn from us as the experienced picture user. This is the prepared part of the prepared environment, mm -hmm. right? It's not just the materials that you're providing, but the, yeah, the inter interactivity you have with that environment is as well. in the environment, right? Yeah. Um, and so she she believed that we should give children lessons with materials like pitchers and spoons and tongs and all mm -hmm. sorts of household things. And really, all we mean by giving a lesson is showing them how you know very very slowly and specifically how to use that material. So with a pitcher, um, I think what I like to do um, when I when I have pitchers at my house and I'm thinking about how to give a lesson with one of them um, is I I kind of just take a look at the the forms of pitchers themselves. You know, so um, I would go to thrift stores and just mm -hmm. like pick up you know just a, a variety of them. This one actually came from a china set. Um, this one is a little bit bigger, also from a set of china. Mm -hmm. And then I think David already showed you this one that has no handle, right? So first thing you do is you look at the material itself and you think, how how would little hands hold this thing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and it, uh, and I, I think not to ask ourselves, like, is this the wrong picture? You know, should we instead, you know, mm -hmm. use a lighter picture? But to say, like, if I were, um, if I were going to use this, how would I do it? Now, David with his big hands, you know, his hands are huge. He just would pick up the pitcher and just mm -hmm. pour it like you were handling mm -hmm. all of these other pitchers. Your inclination is just to, to grasp it. But if we think about the little children's uh, physical strength, this is going to be really, really heavy on their little wrist. And they're probably not going to be successful if they're holding the pitcher crooked, you know, like this, because it's so heavy. Yeah, this is a big, thick earthen So one of the things we do is we teach them to support the bottom of the pitcher, um, you know, to, to, to really to just to put two hands on it. Um, now, this one in particular that I'm showing you, it's pretty big, you know. So, you know, I would expect that if I were giving a lesson to a little child, I might actually have them hold it with two hands and have it um, have something in front of them that they could pour into, you know, so that they have a lot of support with their body. Um, so this would be something that I would, I would probably think might be a little bit more advanced for mm -hmm. some children just because it lacks, you know, it, it yeah. lacking a handle is fine, but it's also, it's made it's out of a really heavy, heavy. ceramic. Yeah. yeah. It's relatively heavy. Yeah. It's and pretty big. heavy and, and really big. So my inclination is to, to hold it like this and to, to pour this way. So two hands around mm -hmm. this pretty heavy, pretty wear. heavy. Right. But it's probably not an ideal picture to start with with a child. That one is kind of feels to me like takes a little more effort. Um, so let's take a look at another one. Let's look at this one. Here I have a, a beautiful porcelain picture, mm -hmm. you know, pretty on the inside too. Um, and it just has this very fancy, elaborate handle. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm going to do is before I'm even giving a lesson to the child, I'm going to experiment, you know, with what the what the ceramicist probably intended, you know, how do they intend for us to hold this picture? And again, you'll notice my inclination is to support the bottom or the front of it with one hand, mm -hmm. um, you know, because again, you know, this, this motion is difficult for children and it's not mm -hmm. as, um, it's not as sturdy, you know, it right. kind of wobbles around. So, but when I put a hand here, it really centers it. You want to try that with, with the big one, yeah, even when, with the big one, just sure. it feels different with two hands, doesn't it? You know, That's if right. you have your hand at the straight onto the bottom or even like here onto the, the front, mm -hmm. it makes it feel very, very secure. And, and I could imagine doing this even as an adult, if I wanted more precision, mm -hmm. if I was trying to pour a, a very precise amount and let's say into a recipe or something like yep. that. Yeah. So looking again at this, Probably not ideal for an itty bitty little hand. Um, let's take a look at this one, right? Even smaller, nice round shape, 
feels good on the bottom. Also ceramic. And a nice little handle, little hand, you know, mm -hmm. would, would a simpler handle, that. a right? simpler handle. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then to pour. And then I would test out the pouring and see how that works. And we're not going to demonstrate that for you here. But what I'd be looking for is how how easily does it pour, you know, uh, in exactly, you know, what shape should I be holding it to, to best secure it, you know. And these are things that you want to think about before you show anything to a child um, because they're going to be watching your exact movements and you don't want, really want to be futzing around with it while they're giving you their attention because they've got like this much attention. The very little ones. Yeah. <laughs> the very little ones. They've got a little bit of attention. Uh, and so you really want to maximize it. So you want to do your preparation ahead of time. So let's pick up this one. It's nice and light, which would feel good to a child. It would feel heavy if it were filled with liquid. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it rests nicely. You know, in my bottom hand, it feels really nice and, and sturdy. Um, and then I can I can be prepared to, to pour it and see how that feels. So that when I give the lesson, mm -hmm. um, which is just a demonstration of pouring, I feel I feel good about like where my hands are, what I'm demonstrating. Am I putting my whole hand in? Am I putting two fingers in? Your child, you'll be surprised that your child will want to mix, mimic some of the exact things. And so one something that Montessori teachers do is that they they really practice using these materials to figure out, do I stick two fingers in and, and rest it on my mm -hmm. third finger? Do I stick all my fingers in? What does that feel like? You know, do I just use one finger and a thumb on top? Mm -hmm. Every little uh, instrument will be designed in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, so, And these weren't created for a Montessori environment. These mm -hmm. are just yeah. various pictures that we've collected over the years or in some cases made. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's really no no way to go wrong with pictures. They're all fun. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't single any of these as like no good for a lesson. I think they're all fun to experiment with, um, and there are several things that you can do with them. So I, do, I well, think, now before we go on, do you yeah. think that uh, what do you think for a very little child? Uh, let's say it's you know a two year old. Would you want them? Is it better to give them something like this metal? where it's not going to break as easily as this seemingly more fragile ceramic one with this delicate handle, or is part of what you would teach them is respect of the environment. So not to be afraid to give them something a little less durable. What's the right choice? Yeah. I think that in Montessori classrooms, um, so for, so with these in particular, these are good for toddlers. They do not break. So if you've got like a one-year-old or a mm -hmm. young two-year-old who's prone to throwing things, you might want to start with some metal pitchers or, uh, or plastic pitchers, something that's not so breakable, um, that wouldn't be a direct danger if your child was super interested in, mm -hmm. um, you Their know. enthusiasm got away from them. Yeah, <laughs> it does happen. So, you know, technically, you know, so traditionally, you know, some little creamer pictures like this are a very traditional start for mm -hmm. Montessori parents online. If you go on Instagram or whatever, look up pouring, you'll often see this, the same kind of little like set. like little creamer little, pictures. Little, little <laughs> metal creamer pictures. Um, but don't be afraid to, to go into the field of, of ceramics and porcelain. If you go into thrift shops and you do your shopping there, they're actually not in general very expensive. That's right. And there's so many of them. You know, you, you kind of have to be careful when you're at thrift shops because, you know, these – um, the ones that you buy there are not for like mouthing or drinking. You want your child, if you're going to use a variety of thrift store objects mm -hmm. with them, you want them to um, kind of be out of the phase where they're just like shoving stuff into their mouth constantly to be totally. kind of aware of what you're giving Because them. we don't know for sure what kind of material they were painted with. Right, or, yeah. right. Um, but, you know, once your child, once children are about three in, in general, they start to have more control. Some of them are still mouthers at that point, so you might monitor. But in general, three-year-olds, you know, two and a half, threes and fours are like breakable stuff is great. And that's probably honestly why I can't find all of the pictures that we've ever bought. You know, I know <laughs> some I've given away to people yeah. and some I've donated back to the Goodwill, um, but some of them were just broken. 
Right. You know, so um, I loved having a variety of pitchers in our own family's kitchen. Uh, it was a really easy way to just whip up a work. You know, we grab a tray, any kind of tray will do. You usually match it to whatever setup of pitchers you have. And then you can just start to play. So for these, you know, people often pour from one pitcher into another pitcher. Um, you can also pour from a pitcher into a like a mug or a singular mm -hmm. container. Um, you can pour the pitcher into a funnel mm -hmm. uh, and then the funnel can go into a vase you know a very mm -hmm. small opening so those are those are all fun and classic is it okay to mix and match can i pour let's say little pebbles into a pitcher of water well um i would say as long as as the receiving pitcher isn't ceramic because mm -hmm. the pebbles will probably break but there's no thing the in, there would be no prohibition <laughs> in the lesson against mixing and matching no, materials. No, Because yeah, they, I, what you're I, doing is you're, give, you're, you've taught them how to pour in a way that really emphasizes the skill that you want. And then you've sort of given them an environment where they can go and do that. And if they're pouring beads or they're pouring rocks or they're pouring foam balls or they're pour, pouring liquids of different kinds, it doesn't really matter. It's the... It's the weight, and in fact, having a variety is probably a good thing, right? It, I would say not all at once. I would I would do one at a time. Mm -hmm. um, generally, you know, you can. Uh, when I was in the toddler classroom, I had a big juice pitcher. It was actually the biggest pitcher I could find, and I actually filled it with something like Duplos or, uh -huh. or something oh, yeah. like that. Uh -huh. And then the children actually used that big pitcher to pour into a big basin. You yeah. know, so it was like a large pouring. It probably made a big noise. Mm -hmm. It was really exciting, yeah. sensorily. Yeah. yeah. And then um, in the classroom, you know, you you might have a variety of different ways to explore pitchers, and some will be with liquid and some would be with dry ingredients. So if you're starting out with dry ingredients you, and you go online and you're like, let's look up some fun pitcher Montessori activities, you're probably most likely going to see lentils or beans. Um, but if you have little ones, be really, really careful with yeah. your beans because they do they do like to stick them in their mouths yeah. They and they, stick, they go up their noses, they go into their ears. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the bottom line is that the material in the of the vase or the the pitcher and the material that you're pouring with is not it doesn't matter in terms of like the value of the lesson it's really more about the safety of the environment of the material and the child so you might not pick a little object that they might stick up their nose because they're too little to know better um but not because it's wrong to pour something like that yeah yeah so we usually recommend oatmeal like oats for toddlers, um, because those are easily disintegrating <laughs> if, they, <laughs> if they accidentally went up a nose or into the ear, unlike beans or corn, which have to be extracted with tweezers at a doctor's office. Not yeah. fun, um, yeah. but it does happen. So if you've got a really, really little one, I would stick with water or I would stick with like dry oats, <laughs> Something. Um, and unless you're super supervising your child and you know that your child is being responsible. But I will tell you, um, one of the biggest problems parents encounter when they first start doing some pouring activities is they will fill up one of these pitchers with lentils, like all the way with lentils, and another is empty. And then they just want their child to pour the lentils into the other pitcher, right? Um, with the two with the two handed method, very nice and carefully. Um, but what happens is the child dumps it into the tray, <laughs> of course. <laughs> like, yes, or, okay. of or course. That checks, makes sense. checks the lentils across the room or, or like reaches in with their hands and, <laughs> and throws them, right? Um, and so this is so disappointing if you have been waiting and waiting for your child to be old enough for Montessori. Like classic and you're Montessori like, pitcher gonna, activity. Do the classic pictures. I found the perfect pictures. And I put these beautiful little lentils inside. And all my child wants to do is just like, dump them on the floor <laughs> behind them, which really literally happens. Um, and I actually, it has become something of, it should be a meme. It really should. Yeah. Um, but I remember being a, a mama of uh, our two children. And when our youngest was about two, I had by then uh, witnessed all these photos of little toddlers with uh, that, you know, you can take a perfect picture of any child, you know, just mm -hmm. before they dump the lentils on the floor, you can take <laughs> the beautiful picture of the child using the pictures to pour the lentils the appropriate way. Right. Um, and so one of these days it was like, 
this just does not make sense to me. You know, these having these little toddlers with these lentils. And <laughs> so I was like, let's just give this a try. So I got out a casserole dish because I wanted something with a really thick lip because just in case this was going to happen. And then with our youngest, when he was a just turned two and I knew he was too young for this kind of a pouring work, I gave him the two, these two pictures probably with, with a whole bunch of lentils in them. And the first thing he does is pour them into the casserole dish mm -hmm. um, because that's just what's interesting and then play with them, you yeah. know? Uh, and then he probably went and went, got out one of his little toy trucks or something. Yeah, and, and drove like, it around and made tracks or something. Or, or, or tried to pick it up with his hands and like dump it on the floor. And that's because toddlers are, um, toddlers are special. You know, they, you'll know if your child is not ready for the pouring work, if that's the kind of stuff your child is doing. Because, um, and in that sense, that's where I would say, let's go back to the bathtub and to the sandbox and give more open-ended experiences or or another alternative would be to give less water mm -hmm. <laughs> and a little sponge. So that way, if your child is only has this much liquid and then they spill it out onto the tray on purpose, which is the child's choice, not anything to reprimand them about, then you can just take a sponge, you know, and you can show your child how to clean the tray. And that becomes the interesting part of the work, not the pouring. That's right. But you can see how that turns into a totally different lesson. Yeah, it goes from a practical life activity about pouring to one about cleaning up. Right. And or about with, using a sponge. Using or a about, sponge. Or about or the or properties of water and how water can, yeah, flows and, around on a tray mm -hmm. or how water interacts with wood differently than it does plastic. I mean, there's lots of stuff to learn from just exploration of the elements, which toddlers are famously good at. That's right. Um, but it, it kind of defeats the purpose of you getting all excited about your picture lesson, Which I you think know, so brings, at, at that point, you haven't done anything wrong. Yeah. You can just like take a step back and say, aha, okay, so let's do more exploration of water <laughs> uh, activities, you know, or let's do, um, you know, let's do more sensory type mm -hmm. of activities where my child is really um, engaging themselves in the world sensorially right. rather than focusing on these little fine motor skills because they're just not there yet. Yeah, and they'll get there. So and I mean, I guess, and I think that's kind of the bottom line is it uh, doesn't, uh, don't overthink it, right? I mean, um, you, know, you probably have a picture in your house or something like that. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of alternatives to it, uh, but um, don't overthink it too much. You know, I think a lot of times as parents, we can um, overthink uh, what we're trying to do. We know that the pouring lesson is a classic and we're going to do it with the child and then they do it, they don't do it right. And we think we, and it's very frustrating. Um, and that's just the wrong attitude. It's important for us to recognize that the child is going to learn and that our responsibility is to prepare that environment and to give these kind of essential lessons, which Montessori and, and others, but Montessori specifically for us, has figured out and documented and then provides to uh, for us to, to look at. And uh, it can seem very mundane. I think a lot of times we want to go and buy the fanciest technology or toy, the thing that like this toy will teach your child how to hold a pencil. Well, it's actually uh, this thing right here, this picture, could teach your child how to hold a pencil. It doesn't seem intuitive, but it's actually true. And when we overthink it or we try and cr find really, really precise toys and or things that we say are scientifically designed to match that, we often are actually depriving our children of the natural inclinations they have, which will teach them how to do things like hold a pencil. Or here I see a pair of scissors. I mean, how... <laughs> <laughs> it looked it looked scarier than it was I mean that you know but you know um it takes fine motor skill to be able to to be able to uh open and close the scissors and use the scissors there's steps and things that you would do along the way including being able to hold small objects pour them think about how much pressure or uh you're going to put on it or how much tilt you're going to put all of those are parts of uh, the learning process, and they don't require gadgets or special toys. It's it can be as simple as I went to the uh, Salvation Army or the Goodwill or whatever, and I I picked up a bunch of fun, pretty little uh, pots and and, and pitchers that uh, my child's going to get to play with in the bathtub or the sandbox, and I'm going to do some very basic lessons with them, and 
they're going to have fun at, you know, what you're going to find is they, they may watch you do the lesson and then walk away. And then you'll come back a few hours later or the next day and you see them secretly do or quietly doing the pouring activity exactly as you showed them because they've sucked it up and uh, they're just not going to perform uh, on will or on demand. So don't overcomplicate it. Don't, uh, don't rob your children of uh, the good stuff that comes from simplicity, which I think is a, a real challenge in our modern world. <laughs> it's a huge challenge. We, we really <laughs> overcomplicate our children's lives. and We overcomplicate our own lives, totally. too. So don't do it. The picture, yeah. it's so humble, and yet it's so amazing. So is it important? Should you have a picture in your life? I would say yes. Have <laughs> as many pictures as your heart desires. <laughs> <laughs> you really can't go wrong, can you? <laughs> They're so cute. They're cute. And they come in all kinds and all sizes. And just why not? Well, it's just so satisfying, <laughs> even as adults. I mean, how many of us as adults, we have a tea ritual or coffee ritual. And, you know, that that activity, it's very satisfying. It's something about... You know, we we focus on sensorial learning with little ones, you know, the under five, but all I, I'm going to argue that all humans, because we're sensorially bound, we have our five senses and they direct so much of our life. So even though we become adults and we stop practicing sensorial things, there's still something very satisfying about holding this cup or in this case, this pitcher. Imagine if it was full of something warm or just more water or you could smell it or there's beans or something in it that you could spend, turn with your finger. It's very, very satisfying. Your children are going to have that same experience. It's just going to be teaching them something really, really wonderful. Yeah. Pitcher versus iPad. Pitcher all the way. Pitcher. <laughs> A lot cheaper too. <laughs> it is. All right. Cheaper well, and better. That's where we're going to stop today. I want to remind everyone that you can find this essential Montessori homeschool materials packet on our website, that's easily right. downloadable Ooh. at childoftheredwoods.com. And also um, that if you want to go deeper into exploring like how pictures fit into the practical life sequence, you should consider joining our primary That's course. right. We have all the lessons laid out, uh, uh, leveled one, two, three for the toddler, preschooler, and kindergarten set. And so you can learn all those lessons and how to give them uh, at uh, charlotteredwoods.com. Uh, and if you like this show, please give us a thumbs up or maybe leave a comment if you're so inclined. <laughs> we do love reading comments and thoughts. We love teaching and sharing our love of Montessori. Uh, don't forget you can listen to this as a podcast on our website or through your favorite podcast distributor. Uh, and uh, you can get all that on our website. All right. We'll be back next Tuesday at 1 o'clock p.m. Pacific. We'll see you then. Bye. <laughs>